them yeah. through that. You just want to uh, unlock it for them so that they can. Yeah, it will be unlocked the minute we let everyone in. Everyone, uh, you just address. Wait, let your kid Ronnie sort it, boys. Can you just address all questions like. that get asked? Yeah, yeah, I'll do that. Uh, you don't need my help. I'll just. I'm gonna remove in. myself from the panelist after. Is that fine, or do you? Ronnie, I'm just done. Yeah, that, that's shower. perfect. If there's an issue, I'll just WhatsApp you. But I should be fine. Cool. Perfect. Okay, I'm cool. ready. I'm ready. I just wanted to do this properly. No, it doesn't. <laughs> okay, that all. Everyone's coming in. <laughs> Yeah, but I'm not lost. What happened to the screen? So, Ronnie, where are you now? I'm here. Now we've lost you. He went. He up, He turned the world upside down. Eh? Yeah, I now it should work. That's it. Now we're in business. Where's your boss? <laughs> so where, where, why can't I see hey, anyone else? Drop it off. We're gonna start. Let's start. No mosques. Uh, no mosques. Yeah. Come a bit closer, Ronnie. A little bit closer to the screen. It's getting organized here. I've got some, some, uh, some props. There we go. Right there. Okay, but we yeah. can start. Yeah. I think we're just waiting for some more people to join. Um, yeah. Give it two more minutes. Give it to one pause. Right. Can people see us? People can see us and they can hear us. So. Be careful what you say. <laughs> <laughs> Currently have around 85 people and the list is just climbing. 87. We have so to give them, if they're not happy, we get, they get their money back. How does it work? Um, that's, you're going to have to take up with the rabbi. I'm, I'm not too sure on that. <laughs> Guys, just, just a question. Are we calling it a hard stop at eight or do you want to see how it goes? Yeah, it goes. It's um, we, we normally... Rabbi, you on mute. Five to eight, this thing finishes. We never Five ever to keep nine, it. You mean. Five to nine. The only thing we, we, we keep it uh, before before nine, it finishes for sure. Rabbi, there's some meaningful questions people want to know, and it runs over. We've got, we'll to people, sure. we've got to tell people that it's officially ended and now afterwards is the Fabrega. Just relax. Don't be so prescriptive. <laughs> I'll just stay out of it. Yeah. Quite nice, this. I think if we already, maybe we should kick off. If everyone's yeah, happy. Give it Thirty seconds. Before we start, Ronnie said, he, "I want to just before we start, Ronnie, you in Kiev? What's yeah. happening? Putting my mask on. What's happening in Kiev? Well, I'm wearing a mask. What do you know what's happening in Kiev? Okay, yeah. <clears throat> I, just, I I want to be under the radar here. I even got, I've even got my snakes, Rabbi. Here we go, now we're talking. Now we're talking. <laughs> yeah. Wait, Ivan's trying to call me. Hang on a second. Ivan, this is like a sidebar. Hey? 30 seconds and okay, then we're we'll starting. Okay, okay. Take it off there. and counting. Okay. Okay, Rolf, are we all happy? Everyone, everyone ready? We can start. Go. Okay, cool. Well, everyone, thank you. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. Uh, tonight's talk will be run slightly differently. We'll have one of South Africa's top entrepreneurs, Ron Silverman, interview Ivan Epstein and Ronnie Aptiaka. Uh, this evening's talk will be based on capitalism versus corona. A host, an industrial engineer, and an award-winning entrepreneur is the CEO of Webfluential and a winner of the Absolute Jewish Entrepreneur of the, War, of the Year Award. On behalf of Chabad Young Drivers and our viewers, I'd like to thank you all for, the, for your time this evening. Tonight, you'll also have the chance to win the world's smaller cell phone, so please keep your phones ready to enter. Over to you, Ron, and once again, thank you very much. Thanks, Hilly, and thanks, Chabad, for sponsoring this evening and making it possible. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Ryan, a practicing entrepreneur since the age of 16. I've had some success but certainly a highlight for me is being here tonight. It's my honor and privilege to introduce all of you tonight and learn from two of, of South Africa's great entre entrepreneurs. As we go along, please, you'll see there's a Q&A little button at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to push questions through 
and a little bit later in the evening, we'll take some questions for, for the entrepreneurs to answer. So let me first introduce Ivan Epstein. Ivan began his early career in accounting, thereafter followed an entrepreneurial calling when he co-founded Softline in 1988. It was the early days of the PC revolution and he saw an opportunity to revolutionize small businesses in moving from manual to affordable PC-based business systems. Ivan led the company's growth from startup to an IPO on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange in 97. In September of 2003, Softline joined FTSE 100 listed Sage Group. For several years, Ivan held senior roles at Sage, most recently as CEO of Sage International until his retirement from his executive roles in October 2016. Ivan was until recently chairman of the Sage Foundation and has and continues to be involved in a number of philanthropic organizations throughout his career. Among numerous accolades, Ivan was awarded the Ernst & Young or EY South Africa's Best Entrepreneur in 99-2000 and thereafter appointed to the panel of judges where he is actively involved and serves as chairperson. Ivan was awarded SA's IT Personality of the Year in 2009. His enthusiasm for entrepreneurship continues as he actively continues to chair, advise and invest in a number of businesses. He continues to inspire and mentor others, delivering talks at numerous business schools, institutions, and forums around the world. Welcome, Ivan. Cool, you're on mute, Ivan. On to Ronnie. So Ronnie, up here. thanks, Ivan. Ronnie is in Kiev at the moment. We'll hear from him in a minute. He was born in Cape Town, South Africa, attended the University of the Witwatersrand, where he graduated cum laude with a master's in computer science. In 93, Apteka co-founded Internet Solutions, South Africa's first internet service provider, which became one of the country's most successful post-apartheid businesses, winning numerous technology awards. Apteka has written a number of papers, published both locally and internationally, and has a blog called Pretty Apt that he updates regularly. He is a partner in the video games company Roommate Studio, which developed games such as Piano City and Saito's Puzzle Adventure. In December 2018, Apteka became an advisor at Performante in London and at Ten Guards in Kiev. As a recognized business leader and speaker, he has appeared at the Discovery Leadership Summit alongside others such as Sir Richard Branson, Tony Blair, and Al Gore. He's a published author with notable books, Ronnie Aptek's Funny Business, The Secrets of an Accidental Entrepreneur, Do You Love It or IT in the Morning, and Trading Spaces, Exploring Internet Solutions. Since 2000, Aptek has been one of the leading independent film producers in South Africa. His films include Material, Tell Me Sweet Something, and Cold Harbor, among many, many others. Too long to list tonight. So tonight's topic is Capitalism and Corona. I think we can all agree that the world has certainly changed in the last couple of months. You both have unbelievable entrepreneurial journeys. If you think back to perhaps some of the toughest or darkest challenges that you, you've, you've conquered, Ivan, let's start with you. Can you maybe describe a certain challenge that stands out and how you overcame it and perhaps what lessons that we can apply in today's Corona world? Thanks, Ryan. Um, Ryan, um, I think, you know, throughout ones, when you found a business and you work it from the grassroots up, you, there's, no, there's numerous challenges and they, and they, um, they appear all the time. Um, I remember from the, you know, the early days of founding the company and trying to get one's first customer. You know, that's a challenge in its own. And then, so everything's based on relative size as you seem to, and, and as you develop the business, so different challenges. So you're dealing with, you know, the business challenges of growing a business from grassroots up. And then you're also dealing, you know, by managing young kids and uh, going through the process of being a young adult into fatherhood and, uh, and maturing as the business goes on and your personal life continues to develop. So I think there were numerous challenges along the way. If I recall, possibly one of the most challenging times of my business career was uh, the move from a private company to a public company. Um, you know, I was in my late 30s and nobody really prepares you for that. It's a very different um, perspective when you go from being private to public. And uh, I think that was a real challenging time. But 
I think, you know, if you believe in yourself and you're optimistic and, you, you know, because you have this vision from the outset, I think you really, and you know and you, and you believe that you can succeed, those challenges become opportunities. So I always saw a challenge as an opportunity and I still continue to. And if you talk about the current times uh, and, the, and, the, and the hard times that the world's experiencing at the moment, and, you know, again, it's relative to where one is in the world and what one's experiencing. But I certainly see this as also a time of opportunity. It's a time of hardship for many. And, but, but sometimes the best businesses or the best opportunities arrive in a, in a period of adversity. So I, I really think uh, it's just very much within one's mindset and how you deal with it. Um, sadly, there are many businesses that, uh, you know, due to forced closure, will have a hard time recuperating. But I think those type of businesses also bear in mind that they're run by entrepreneurs there were people that once, you know, that went through hardships, that started these businesses and have run these businesses. And I think, you know, a lot of it will get back on track in the fullness of time. But, uh, you know, challenges, as I, you know, to conclude for me is an opportunity. Wow, thanks, Ivan. Ronnie, books, movies, games, uh, uh, internet solutions. I'm sure you've had many, many challenges along the way. Can you maybe describe some of your darkest times and, and what saw you through? and how we can learn from that in today's times? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I changed, uh, you know, I, I, I had different journeys across different industries. So that, um, you know, that, that was a big reinvention. And then I, had, I went through a further reinvention five years ago when I, uh, not five years, four years ago, when I started uh, learning about the cybersecurity industry. So, you know, I've had I've had to you know reinvent myself a few times, and uh, that's difficult because as you know, as you progress through life, you kind of think, you know, your head's full. How much more can you learn? <laughs> and you know, and, but it's actually quite amazing how strong and resilient we actually all are. You know, and uh, uh, like I haven't said, you know, like we're talking about entrepreneurs and they kind of roll with the punches. I mean, me and I haven't chatted about this a lot and. The strong guys, you know, get up. I mean, doesn't mean that if you if you fail that you don't um, uh, feel pain, you don't cry. I've, I've failed many times. Like on the film journey, it's been um, uh, over 18 years, and the first 10 years were filled with tremendous pain, and now it's filled with a little bit of pain. <laughs> the pain is more is more manageable. But um, uh, you know, the thing the thing about entrepreneurs is that you. You keep taking risks. You, you keep trying to sell. You keep knocking on doors. You keep trying to um, inspire others. And uh, I think some of my hardest lessons was, you know, going from like a team at IS, which was a fantastic bunch of people, to being on my own in the film business. I, I wish I had someone like uh, Ivan, for example, as a partner who knows uh, uh, the ropes way better and understands also the fine points of negotiating with people. I'm a bit uh, sometimes too autistic and a bit too, you know, uh, uh, and a bit too soft, you know? So, so, you know, I always wish maybe I had a partner like Ivan that could have helped me uh, uh, navigate the business side of the film business because all businesses, you know, are composed of creating something and selling something. And they often are very disconnected journeys. Making a film and selling a film are, are two totally different things. And they actually don't even have a lot in common. In fact, I don't even know. I have a lot of insights here. You know, someone can make the form, another person can sell the form. Uh, and I'm trying to do both. So uh, it's, it's, been, it's been tough, you know, trying to learn different industries. And then in the last four years, learning about the cybersecurity industry has been particularly tough because that's another whole sector of IT. It has nothing to do with, say, software development, uh, uh, like in the traditional sense of... Um, a big software house or uh, connectivity in the sense of an internet company. Security is a software uh, a space all of its own, you know, so, uh, and it, 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 it's flooded with thousands. I think there's up to 5,000 vendors today of different security products. So just to get your head around that was another learning curve for me. And, uh, 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 and today I can hold my own in a, in a cybersecurity discussion and I can add value to companies because I understand you know, the, the different pillars of security. But I guess those were some of my hardest uh, uh, lessons. And Ivan, I'm sure you can agree. Like you kind of, if you succeed once, you kind of think you're invincible. 
And then you jump onto the next thing thinking, oh, it's going to be a piece of cake. But it actually sometimes, what? <laughs> it's actually never a piece of cake. I haven't actually sent you a picture of some cake just now. Did you get that? Yeah, was, uh, I mean, to, to Ronnie's point, I and mean, he's right. And you know, it's interesting. So I, I built a business over 25 to 28. It was like 28 years when I left. And then you move on, and I think it's a lot easier to stay where you are. And it's always better yeah. to be in this yeah. comfort zone because it's a lot more comfortable. You know, and, and you should stick to what you know, really, because when you've learned something over so many years, I mean, and you become very skilled in a particular industry, you're really good at what you do. And then the business grows to a particular size. And when it's a particular, you have a great infrastructure and a lot of people around you to whom you are able to delegate. And very, and most often those people that you surround yourselves with have, have have actually better skills than yourself because you become a little bit removed from the day-to-day operations of a business. Yeah. So it is a lot easier to stay in one's comfort zone. But and I and I and I stepped down in 2016 and I moved on to do other things. And you do get out of your comfort zone to, to Ronnie's point. And it and it's. And then you suddenly think, well, am I as good as what I thought I was? So you start, yeah, yeah. you know, you have to rebuild your skill sets and you have to rebuild your courage. But if you, as I again to my point, you know, being optimistic and, and really being fearless of what you, you know, embark on, you know, you can overcome that. But it is tough. And, and you know, Ronnie's changed industry many times. I mean, I'm in my second phase of being and, 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 and I still help IS, I still help die, die data. And I, I still work in forms and I still work in security. So I've had to kind of, um, you know, stay up to date on three different fronts. But the fundamental skill sets of relationship building and selling and mentoring, that doesn't change on the, uh, on the industry. But to Ivan's point, uh, uh, the one thing that you, you always have to do is you, you always have to stay humble. Because like, whether you're the king of one industry, let's say you sell cars and you make cars and you're the best car guy in the world. And then the next thing, you, know, you start making and selling pizzas, but you have no track record in pizzas. So you have to start knocking on doors and eat humble pizza pie because yeah. it's as hard, you know, that time round. There's very few people other than like, say, you know, Richard Branson, because you mentioned this now, that has multiple industries from mobile to aircraft to, uh, to banks that he can kind of leverage his brand across all those uh, different uh, product sets. But you don't find that very often. If someone changes from a food business to an IT business to an airplane business to a, I don't know, a hotel business, they're all very different. And each time you have to go cap in hand to try and find those first customers. And it can be, it can be like incredibly painful. And you yeah, kind of Ronnie, think, oh, you use the, sorry to interrupt, you use right? the word reinvention. Um, which I think is a key word, particularly in these times where a lot yeah, of yeah, business owners, you know, for, for macroeconomic factors, they aren't able to operate and they do have to look at reinvention. So along the same theme, guys, what, what are the principles um, or guardrails that you need to, to either reinvent yourself or reinvent your business in order to operate in these times? I think, you know, Ryan, you certainly need a lot of self-esteem and self-confidence because yeah. that's what drives entrepreneurship. And I mean, if you look at, I mean, and to Ronnie's point, it's not that often you see people making that switch to different businesses, because certainly if you've been at a business for like over 25 years, I mean, I recall, you know, one of who I've spent time with, one of the guys who I admire, who at the age of 54 restarted himself was Nady Kirsch. I mean, nobody really knows that at Nady, at, at 54, I think it was 54 or 55, Nate, he re started from scratch. And that was, you know, in his career and financially, and he built a global business. So if you look at someone like that, so why was he able to do it? He has, he, he has an abundance of self-confidence. He's, he's a deep thinker. He's very smart at business. And he has a lot of, and he had that business experience. So don't underestimate, you know, the experience one gains over many years within a business. Because it's the old story, you know, also that, you know, the longer you work and the harder the work, the, you, you work, the smarter you get. So I think that's important. But I think also, you know, I mean, and Ronnie will just give his comments in that regard. But I think, you know, the world's faced at the moment with this, uh, with this crisis, which I know many of my contemporaries and, and certainly my kids and their contemporaries and those kids below them, never ever believed they'd be in such a situation. Nobody did. 
And uh, so you suddenly find yourself in this, like, you know, this global tsunami. And, um, and people are, are looking to deal with this from a commercial point of view. And I think most businesses, so nobody can turn around and say they haven't been impacted or, you know, other than businesses, let's say like Zoom or Facebook and, and, and a few others who really boomed in a time like this. I'd say almost everybody's been impacted by this and they've been impacted financially, they've been impacted psychologically, they've been impacted. It's also from a family dynamic standpoint, you know, some people, you know, have used this time to, to rekindle relationships and be able to come closer to people. I mean, I for one have been very lucky that my kids from London have been here in South Africa with, with us. And, you know, you spend time together that, what, that you haven't spent for years. And I'm sure a lot of people listening in this evening will attest to that, you know, saying, yeah, they have spent time together. So you take, you take, the, you take the unfortunate situation you're in, Ryan, and you create a positive, you know, experience from it, which I'm sure... A lot of people will talk to it. And I read, uh, Ronnie, you wrote a blog recently, which, which I found very interesting about, I mean, you turned the coin about, you were quite dramatic about capitalism's role in the current environment. And maybe you just want to say a few words about it. Well, I mean, I'd also want to just to touch on something that you said about Nate Kush. I, I don't know him, but he's obviously quite a legendary business person and you know, highly accomplished. Uh, but we were saying the other day, Ivan, when we chatted about some guys are just a full package. Like, you know, I, I, I'm not good with numbers. I mean, Ivan, you know me, but enough. Like, uh, I'm, I'm not a financial guy at all. So I, I, and on the movie side, you know, I was kind of on my own. And uh, You managed to get some cash out of me for a movie, Ronnie, so you're not too bad with the numbers. Yeah, but you got it back, and we were good. And then that, that, and that was a beautiful movie. Yeah, fair, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know if we're allowed to talk about actual things, but uh, Ron, can we just, I mean, because we actually got it onto Netflix a month ago. Uh, 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 and if anyone, no, give it a give yeah, it a if pen. anyone's on the call and wants some inspiration to watch material with the Riyad Moose on Netflix, it's a real pleasure. And we've actually now uh, uh, opened up the audience, and uh, it's getting commentary from Australia, Canada, India. So we're quite excited about it. And material two will hopefully be on Netflix in a few months, which turned out as good as the first one. And in light of the current challenge with cinemas and social distancing, Netflix actually a pretty good result for it. So. If we can actually get that concluded, uh, um, you know, we'll be all very chuffed about that. Um, but Sorry, I was saying, is that, but, but, but some people are like the full package, and maybe you get like some entrepreneurs that are so well-rounded and have got such multidisciplinary skills that they can constantly like conquer these mountains. Like I, I certainly battle in many areas, like in negotiations, in finances. So I, I always would need someone to to help me on my journey, and maybe I, you know, will accomplish less than someone else because I, I, I'm not like a, you know, multi, uh, what's the word, talented in all different disciplines. You know, I'm certainly not uh, good with spreadsheets and numbers. Great. So are you volunteering, Ivan, to help uh, some of our audience on that front? No, I'm just joking. Um, but on Ivan's comment, uh, capitalism seems to always trump communism. And oh, it's yeah, the block. Sorry, I was, getting, yeah. Uh, yeah, I was uh, getting lost in a fantasy world of Ivan helping me <laughs> So I think, I mean, I'm sure you guys have seen what's happening in the U.S. as we speak. There's looting happening, and that's kind of exposed these flaws in, in, in capitalism, while communism, on the other hand, seems to have weathered uh, the corona storm to a certain extent. So, Ronnie, talk to us about your views on that and, and some of the flaws that have been exposed in your view. Well, I, I, I think it's stating the obvious, uh, um, but it's a very, very important conversation, and it seems to be all over the place on everyone's, you know, lips at the moment on journalists, bloggers, and just, you know, all of us in the public, uh, um, you know, all of us as private citizens, that the, the, the inequality in the world is so, um, like, what's the word? It, it's, it's so huge. I mean, I don't know what else. Is, it doesn't need a fancy word. It's big. It's, 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 it's too much. And, you know, the gap between the rich and poor and the fact that the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer is clearly like so uh, uh, fundamental at this point with all this talk in the US, for example, about bailouts and stimulus, how much of that money, for example, is going to go to the hands of the people that really need it, you know, how much of it is going to bail out airlines and banks. And, um, you know, I, I think that one of the fundamental reasons we're in this crisis is not because of Corona and a lot of people Again, I'm saying that it's not because I'm so smart. It's like stating the obvious, in my opinion. 
but Corona has exposed the kind of rot in the system because Ivan and I, you know, I know Ivan very well. And like, we both believe in, you know, working hard, taking a risk, applying a bit of chutzpah, you know, killing yourself if you have to, working through the night, you know, having some fun, laughing a bit, but ultimately just doing what you believe in, like Ivan said earlier, and being confident and, 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 and being convicted and standing by, you know, what you're trying to do and having a sense of purpose. But, um, you know, that, that's entrepreneurship in its purest form. What's happening in the world with crony capitalism, tenderpreneurs, and just fat cat nonsense is that the little guys, you know, the, the I mean, Michael Moore had a great tweet uh, that I saw this morning where he said, the simple answer, just raise the minimum wage. You know, why is it that the Walton family, the richest family in America, are also the biggest lobbyists for minimum wage? So they've got, I think they're worth $500 billion. I mean, if they're worth $400 billion, does it make any difference? I mean, I don't know. It seems like uh, an extraordinary amount of money, but they, you know, I don't know the Waltons. I have no problems with the Waltons. Uh, I've been to some Walmarts in my life, nice stores. But, um, you know, this, this, this squeezing the, the small guy, you know, the, the, the hard working, the labor force, you know, that there's nothing on the table. You know, one, one of the things that is, is, is messed up in the world, when they say in America, for example, that the job market before Corona was the best it's ever been, what they don't tell you is that one guy's got three jobs. So one guy works in the day in one job, at night in another job, and on the weekend in another job, and now it's counted that three people in America are employed. And that kind of warped, you know, uh, uh, statistic uh, is... Um, is uh, um, you know is is, um, is is skewing like the actual reality of things, just like the stock market and the job market are are, are disconnected. You know, uh, um, uh, I'm sorry, my phone's buzzing. I'm just uh, uh, pushing away with my foot. But just like the stock market and the job market are, like they're in different worlds. Like uh, the, the 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 stock market has no connection to what's going on in the real world. And I think this thing about um, you know, capitalism is that it's it's uh, it works when it works in the honest and pure sense, but it's been perverted, and we are paying the price for it now. You know, and the greed in the world is at an all-time high. It's seen in the inequality. It's seen in the in the fact that the middle class in America are almost kind of non-existent. And that used to be the strength of the U.S. was that that big that big uh, uh, oh, sorry that big middle class. But uh, it, they're shrinking and they're almost disappearing. And um, you know, going back to communism, here I'm sitting in, in Kiev, where you know, 20 years ago they didn't, even, they didn't even have a concept of cash, you know, and everybody was bartering. If the world uh, uh, had to collapse tomorrow and had a proper hard reset, and there was no, say, dollar, you know, things here would be not so bad because we'd go back to where it was 20 years ago, and most people still remember. They'll start trading food you know, on the street corner and maybe there'll be some soup kitchens, but most of the population still remember that. So it's not a big stretch. And uh, a place like this has so many crises that it's just another crisis. Whereas in America, this crisis is like the end of the world because, you know, a guy can't get his pumpkin spice decaf latte, play racquetball, see the shrink, and you know, it's all a big mess. You know, I, I think the world... So let, me, let me pause you there. I think... Um, I think, you know, entrepreneurs obviously operate in, in a capitalist world and, and kind of um, spot opportunities. So, so let me turn to Ivan. I mean, what does this mean, uh, do you think, for, for opportunities and how can, we, how can we look to a positive future, uh, you know, with the so-called uh, uh, flaw in capitalism that we're starting to see? Well, you know, I'm, I'm not sure, you know... I mean, you go through times and the times you're experiencing at the moment, uh, right? But I'm not, you know, people forget quickly. People move on. Times change. Situations change. Hopefully, we'll be through the, the epidemic, you know, in the not too distant future. And hopefully, there'll be a vaccine. And, and then it'll be something we look back on. But I certainly think that, um, I certainly, I mean, one thing I do believe with the, the various countries printing money, and certainly if you take the U.S. that are printing hordes of money, um, I think the generations below us will be paying for this for a long time to come, yeah. and they'll pay in the form of you know it'll be in the form of increased taxes and various other measures. But but that doesn't mean now because this has hit us there aren't the opportunities. And I think you know I for one, having had time you know spent so much time in uh, 
being at home and, and not running around like I normally do and being on an airplane and up and down, you know, you have time to reflect and you, and you, I yeah. think you have time to, to conceptualize new ideas. And uh, I certainly, you know, I think productively I've come up with some, you know, good ideas. I'm looking to do new things um, as we move through this and open new and open doors for new opportunities. So I certainly can see that. And there'll be different types of businesses and people will adapt accordingly. And there'll be those entrepreneurs that have taken uh, the opportunity to do what I'm saying and because they're doing it anyway and, um, and have come up with something and you'll see, you'll see a different type of business starting in some regards. I mean, you know, there's a lot of talk about that, you know, Zoom's working so beautifully and everybody will work from home and people can save money on rentals and various other opportunities. But the reality is Zoom is working well and Teams are working well and uh, WebEx works well because it had to work well. You know, it was either that or no business. So it really was a great substitute. But, you know, I for one, am, 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 I'm a big proponent of culture within an organization. And to me, culture is everything because if you build culture, you build a great company. And if you get the culture right and the people behave right and, and people are engaged and love what they do, um, you know, it's, how, you know, the business, you know, moves and it projects forward. And I think it's very difficult to build culture like this. I mean, and I think when people are able to get back into gatherings and that, you'll see people back to that. And, uh, but I think, you know, in 2020 with the kind of tech we've had available to us, it's been amazing because if you think back, to 19 uh, to 1918, you couldn't have done this, right? So how did how did businesses operate? They couldn't do anything; yeah. just probably shut. But there are many businesses that have just kept going vibrantly through the through the epidemic. So, so, so there will be a lot there will be a lot of opportunities. And, and anybody out there who's watching, who's who's thinking, certainly to to a younger generation of guys, guys and girls who are looking to start businesses. Um, they, they know the opportunities and they're thinking of those opportunities and there've been people that are preparing those opportunities. And you'll see in the next year or two or three or four, these things will spring up. It'll be like flowers coming up. It's, it's going to happen. So what advice, I see some questions coming in from the audience. Um, what advice do you have for, for the, the small business uh, owner or uh, the middle class, uh, particularly in South Africa, how do you, how, what advice can you guys give them? Who should we start with, Ronnie? Um, well, I, 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 before we try and answer that, uh, I'd, I'd just like to tap into what Ivan said, because I, I also am, uh, um, you know, constantly having ideas. There, there is a lot of opportunity that this global change represents. And I've, I'd like to believe, like when the rabbi set this up, Ivan, that the people that are on the call, we don't know who they are, uh, um, but I imagine it's real entrepreneurs and people that have entrepreneurial aspirations and people that are honest, good people. And we're not talking about crony capitalists on a call like this. That, that's my understanding. So like in the world of pure entrepreneurship and pure creativity, the good guys will have an opportunity to keep trying to push the envelope and trying to create. And one of the things that comes up in my like friends at, at, at IS and DD is like the acceleration in, in, in digital transformation because of this Corona crisis. So there, absolutely, there's a massive opportunity in cybersecurity, for example, as a separate discussion, uh, because, you know, hacking has gone through the roof. We don't see it in the news because it's all Corona uh, and now it's all America, but um, like cybersecurity is one. And then online, like, I, I, you know, you guys are talking about Zoom, like online communications and uh, I mean, it is challenging. How do you build culture online? But people do, you know, people do. And it represents another opportunity. You know, companies will change the way they do things to suit these new kind of uh, behavioral, you know, parameters. And uh, it absolutely doesn't mean that the economy is smaller or bigger. It means just things are different. And those who are creative and apply themselves and will take the risks, you know, will build new businesses. Obviously, some businesses will have challenges like restaurants and not because the restaurants are bad because there's these new behavioral constraints like social distancing, like airplanes. If you're only allowed to have like one person per row on an airplane and we don't know yet what it all means, you know, it's still a bit too soon. But certain businesses will definitely be challenged because uh, of just the physical limitations that this crazy coronavirus is imposing on us. 
but then other opportunities will uh, uh, be made available. You know, ma imagine it becomes mandatory, for example, for everyone who travels to go on 14 days quarantine. To me, there's a business there. Go and create a quarantine hotel, you know, that actually has meals and entertainment and Zoom facilities. I mean, there are so many ways to reinvent what we're doing to suit these kind of new parameters. They might not be fun to start with, but before we know it, they'll become second nature. So I don't, I don't think the nature of opportunity has changed at all. People still need to live. People need to eat. They need to be entertained. They need to communicate. They need to wear clothes. They need to shop. They need to read books. But nothing really changes. It's just the way we do things change. And I, I'll just give, Ivan, mean, if I can just indulge for a second what I told you the other day, right? Because like movies, everybody loves movies. And the movie, and everybody thinks they know how to make movies. There's three subjects that everyone in the world's an expert on. Restaurant, sex, and movies. You can't be an expert on brain surgery or how to solve a legal problem. But when it comes to restaurants, everybody knows how to run a restaurant. I don't know why, but it's just the way it is. And the same with movies. Everybody knows how to make a movie. Somehow we're all born with filmmaking abilities. But what's interesting about the film business is because of Corona, there's all these new guidelines coming out of Los Angeles. And the film budgets are going up because you have to have, if, if the three of us were set builders, and Ryan, you had the hammer, I had the chisel, and, and Ivan had the screwdrivers, we could all share tools six months ago. Now you're not allowed to. If you're building sets on a film set, everyone has to have their own tools because you can't touch each other's equipment because it might have the virus. You know, there have to be more toilets on the set. The catering now, you can't all sit together. You know, you have to sit like six meters apart in a, in a film set. Film sets are very tight budget, very tense, high energy environments where people are always running around and changing little bits and pieces. And now you have to socially distance everyone and clean everything. So film budgets are gone up. And the other thing which is interesting about film, no new content is being made because even though there's these guidelines, no production has started. Production froze a few months ago worldwide. So it's the first time ever that content creators, and here's another opportunity, that content creators have leverage. They've never had it before. It's always a begging game. I'm still begging, but we've got more leverage. So now Netflix, for example, is saying, guys, what have you got for us? Whereas before you'd have to phone a million times just to find who to speak to. And now they're saying, we don't have new content. So whatever you've got, you show us. So there's another opportunity. And the last thing on content, it's amazing how journalists and bloggers and professors like Scott Galloway, I dig Scott Galloway, but he's blown up. He became like a big YouTube star. And uh, it's quite amazing how a lot of these academic guys that were kind of on the fringe are now going mainstream because of YouTube. Now YouTube went from huge to super huge over Corona. And that's another opportunity. People are telling stories, which I know me and Ivan love to do. Ryan, I'm pretty sure as an entrepreneur, I mean, entrepreneurs tell stories. And these digital platforms give us the ability to get those stories out there. So we are seeing, you know, out of the US in particular, like academics and professors, and some of them are brilliant. You know, some of them you watch for five minutes and go, oh, not for me. But, but they're using like YouTube, for example, to, to reinvent themselves. And it's actually quite incredible how that platform, which has been there for quite a while, is being, like, it's got a rebirth. And a whole bunch of new stars are being born online that when Corona dies down one day, they, their brand is going to be new. They've got this new brand. Like Scott Galloway is now a YouTube star. Used to be a professor, author, and now is a YouTube star. Amazing. So you're actually saying you're seeing there's more opportunity if you actually look. But... What if you, I mean, how do you spot the opportunity? So, so again, some of the questions from the audience, uh, you know, if you're in the middle class or if you're in a, a small business that's not necessarily digital, how do you, you know, what can you do to reinvent or, or spot that's, those opportunities? That's, that's a good question because, you know, we're talking about, that's a very good question because you always, you know, you use your kind of background or your reference point, like digital is the key word there. Because if you're a small business, you have a once-off restaurant, as I have been said earlier, and one has to be totally sensitive and respectful to this, you've got challenges. The whole world has got, if you're a small once-off restaurant, you know, in, in, I don't know, in Hyde Park or Ilova or Melville or wherever it is, in Rosebank, you know, it's a tough time now for those kind of businesses. And it doesn't, you know, digital doesn't apply. But having said that, look what's going on here in Kiev. The, the online industry for food delivery has gone through the roof. 
So people are running dark kitchens. People are promoting themselves like crazy. It's far more developed here than back in, back in Joburg. So like online food delivery from all these restaurants that are closed has gone mad and they are marketing themselves. Yeah, but I think, Ronnie, that's a worldwide phenomenon at the moment. I think online... Yeah, no, but, but I'm saying, but some so, people haven't, are embracing it more than others. You know, yes, so, yes. so there, there is going to be some need to, to kind of touch on digital, but you can still stay like in your restaurant state. Maybe revenues will be down. It won't be as busy, but I don't know. Maybe it'll be busier. Maybe it'll be most, delivering but, more. But, but Ronnie, most, most businesses, Ryan, even if they talk about traditional type of SMEs, yeah. small to medium business, no matter where you are in the world you are, you have an opportunity to link in digital in some form. I mean, because the online world is offering solutions to those businesses. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's many, uh, there's many businesses that are offering storefronts to traditional businesses. Now, those businesses that have traditionally not have storefronts or not have a web presence, okay, we're just slow to adapt. What, what this situation has done is it's escalated the need to move your business to an old world and digital. And I'll give you an example. If you take somebody who's a gym instructor who traditionally a gym trainer would, uh, would train traditionally on site or on premise, either his gym or at, at the customer's uh, premises, moving to a digital platform, I said, somebody like that can create two types of business yeah, uh, yeah. opportunities. One is their traditional business, and then there's their online presence. So there are those opportunities, and there will be those people that have, would have come through this and will wake up at the end of it and say, you know, I've actually created an additional revenue stream that I didn't believe I had, but I was forced to, so now I have it. Yeah. And the, so those opportunities come up all the time. So I think if anybody's feeling that we're a traditional old world type of business, you know, you, utilize, the, utilize the digital opportunities that there are. And you asked a question earlier about how do those businesses, some of them, it's tough to survive. Now, they, every country has offered different solutions. So if you're a, somebody now listening in from the US, take advantage of the UK of all the government um, opportunities that have been presented to small businesses through this. You take a country like the US. I mean, it's been unbelievable what they've done for, for uh, funding their small businesses or helping them through this uh, epidemic. South Africa to a lesser degree, but then it's based on affordability from the developed to, to, you know, to the mature, to the underdeveloped world. So obviously Africa and the countries within Africa don't have that kind of money that can offer the same type of stimulus as the US or the UK or a country like Singapore or various others. But I think wherever you are, take advantage of what the governments are offering mm -hmm. you to help you navigate through this. Great. Okay. Ivan, here's a question for you. There's a couple, uh, particularly relating to property. So the question reads, what industries are you focusing on and what's your view on the future of commercial property? And with companies talking about using less office space, I mean, obviously, a lot of people, um, you know, getting used to working from home, etc., um, what do you think uh, will happen, in, you know, in the future? Will these properties lose value? What, what, what does that kind of industry look like? The properties will lose value in the short term, Ryan, of course, because there's this whole talk and there's a, there's a trend against it at the moment where people are saying it is okay to work, you know, remotely. But as I said, when we're over the epidemic and we're through it and life returns to normal, hopefully, um, there will be that need again to go back into the office. So I say in the short term, yes, it's a, it's a, it's a difficult situation. Um, to any younger out of there, should you go into property now? Uh, probably ask yourself why. But um, you know what? The world's been through so many challenges, you know, and this is just another challenge, a very tough one, one none of us have gone through before. And uh, property will be okay in the long run. It's got to come back. I mean, it's bricks and mortars. There's only, you know, if you buy a piece of land, be it in downtown LA, uh, so you bidding against it versus someone else. Well, if you don't buy it, that, once the land's gone, it's gone. There's only X amount of land in the world, and they're not making more. So, so property will always be a long-term, safe and secure hold, hmm. which will go through cycles of difficult, you know, difficult times. Right. Ronnie, um, a question for you. What are you doing in Kiev? Um, and maybe an add-on to that, or do you see any kind of similarities or differences to, to how things are happening in South Africa to where you are? Um, well, this, this country was the second, you know, to go into lockdown after Israel. So there's been a long lockdown here. Um, I kind of uh, live here, you know, I, I, I would travel back and forth, but uh, airports are closed. So I was meant to be back 
you know. Uh, um, but uh, you know, obviously, everybody's had to readjust their, uh, you know, their behaviour because you know of the lockdown. So air flights are, are, are out, and I probably won't be back uh, uh, till next year, just because, uh, um, yeah, I, I don't see flights coming, uh, you know, being you know, readily available soon. Um, but just some insights, uh, um, and, and just just to also again add to what Ivan said, because I, I I touched on it earlier, but digital transformation has been accelerated. Now, not every business has the exact same amount of, you know, conduciveness for digital. But, but there is the need, like Ivan said, you know, was touching on, to step out of the comfort zone. And this could create an, another revenue speed. So I think those people that you roll up their sleeves and spend some time learning and reinventing, they might actually be better off for it. Obviously, some businesses are going to, uh, uh, struggle like like property like again you guys were talking about just because it's just not a good time for it and there is this kind of behavioral change of people working from home but just some insight over here on like we've got um, uh, amazing opportunity here we hosted some people here in january actually before the all the lockdown started uh, ukraine is the uh, you know the, the the software hub or kiev in particular is the software hub of europe and uh, they are the big contender to, to India. Where we are now, we are the second biggest like software outsourcing developer, you know, after India. And there's a lot of big tech that has come from here that people just aren't aware of, like Grammarly, Ring.com, Reddle with Spark, uh, PetCube, uh, uh, Better Health, Better Dot Health, which is the biggest like, health AI app in the world, uh, uh, Ajax. I mean, there's a long list of stuff that people use all over the world and in South Africa. It all comes from here, and um, there's like a tech revolution going on here. So the, 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 we, we hosted some people here in January uh, uh, looking to actually take uh, demand from South Africa and, and facilitate supply from Eastern Europe because there's a big talent pool of programmers here. And just to give you some perspective, there's about 200,000 programmers in Ukraine versus 20,000 in South Africa. Hmm. So, uh, um, and I think there's about 23,000 grads in software development coming out each year here. So this is the software hub of Europe. And uh, the second biggest software, you know, center after after India. So there's a lot of opportunity in that space in the IT world. And as all of us know on this call, the, I mean, the, the four of us know that. Uh, uh, sorry, the three of us. The rabbi's gone. I don't know where the rabbi went. But uh, um, but everything is around software. It doesn't matter if you're a hotel, an airline, a, a manufacturer of clothes. Oh, there's the rabbi. He got you back. Uh, um, uh, but everything these days is software driven. So there's always going to be a demand, uh, you know, for IT and software, and digital transformation, you know, sits, you know, at, 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 as, as the foundation for that. And people who need software, this part of the world is developing a lot of that software, and actually also developing a lot of entrepreneurial products where they, you know, like pure yeah. entrepreneurship, where you take a risk and try something and take it to market. Okay, so yeah, I agree. I think it's it, what's interesting is is the tech background. Ivan, moving back to you, uh, a great question from Barry, picking up on one of your previous comments around culture. So uh, it's also something I've faced in business. You know, how do you if culture is one of the key you know pillars of of your business, how do you build that if half of your staff are working from home? And maybe that's an opportunity for you know, for, for helping businesses maintain, retain, and, and build their cultures. You are on mute though, uh, before you begin. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Ryan, as I said earlier, it's, I think it's really difficult to, to build culture remotely. Um, and uh, nothing will replace the, the, the workforce where people are able to mix, mingle, and, you know, and develop the kind of relationships that you can't really develop online. So I think those... You know, because we've had to do this remotely, I'll repeat it, um, it's been okay, it's worked. But um, I think if this had to sustain, if you had to, for example, work remotely for two years, it would be interesting to measure the happiness index within organizations. So if you measure, uh, you know, you, you always measure, measure happiness or culture indexes within organizations. I wonder how it would look or how disparate it would be after a year or two in this environment. Hopefully it's not going to be like that. But uh, to me, cultures, you know, as I said, culture is everything, and uh, culture is what drives profits, what drives revenue, what drives an organisation. And people that have built wonderful businesses, speak to anybody who's built a great business, I'll tell you how they focused on culture and they yeah. focused on the people. And I think, uh, and um, I think 
you know, and I think for some, you know, working remotely and from home, it's just probably been an excuse to slip through the cracks. I mean, I know that's a quite a harsh comment to make, but it's a fact. And, uh, and it suits some people to work from home. Yeah. And I think going back to work for some will be tough. Um, if I was still running uh, uh, Sage at Softline, I would, uh, I would probably be more uh, insistent under certain conditions that people get back to the office as soon as possible. Interesting. Another one, let's go back to Ronnie, a question from Malu. How much does luck contribute to an entrepreneur's success, uh, being at the right place, the right time? And I think we're going to need a lot of luck during this. Uh, Ronnie, you know that. You've been lucky. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I mean, I think uh, all of us here have been lucky, but um, there was a great TED talk. It's not a long one. I think his name is Bill Goss. Is that right? That American... He's a wealthy, successful entrepreneur, uh, mm. and he broke down like success into five factors, like product, uh, like market fit, culture, uh, um, timing was one. There were five things. I can't, I, it was yeah. a great talk. I think his name's Bill Goss, but timing I remember was like 53% of like the success mm. equation. So you can work the hardest, make the best product, take a risk, kill yourself, have the best team, build the best culture, and launch at the wrong time and you know like if you're going to launch a hotel chain now during corona bad time you know uh, but if you're going to launch online food delivery now and you've been gearing up for a year bring in time and nobody can actually determine that timing but this thing about luck because i I've, I've written a lot about this and done a lot of like uh, you know work and it's a strange word but like your yeah, writing work around luck there is a real thing of luck, I believe. Like you can get hit by a bus tomorrow, that's bad luck. And you can win the lottery, that's good luck. You can't say there's any strategy for that. A lot of people who are in the film business will tell you it's all about luck. You know, it doesn't matter if the film's good or bad, it helps. But at the end of the day, there's a lot of luck involved. But then there's all those old sayings, like Gary Player, you know, what's it? Uh, the more he practices, the luck you get. So the more doors you knock on, the luck you get. You know, luck favors the persistence from that book, Built to Last. You know, um, so, the, and, and then there's also the ability to recognize luck. So if somebody tells you that there's big money in oil and you look for oil in the Karoo, you're probably not going to be lucky. If somebody tells you there's big money in movies and you're dumb like me and you try and make movies in South Africa, you're not going to be lucky because we just don't have a big market. You know, there's a big market in the UK a huge market in the US, in China, but South Africa, like Ukraine, don't have big film industries. So if you're gonna try and make films in South Africa, and we've learned this the hard way, you've gotta make them on super tight budgets, you've gotta do things that are very unusual. Uh, uh, you, you can't do kind of carbon copy of Hollywood films. We've tried yeah. that, it doesn't work. And you can't have budgets that are Hollywood budgets. It, it, doesn't, work, it doesn't work. So sometimes you also have to recognize luck. So if somebody says to you, oh, you're launching an airline now, it's very bad luck, but you don't listen and they show you, but no one's flying and you're still launching. You go, yes, the guy didn't listen, you know? And often, I mean, I'm sure both of you will agree. Often we don't listen because we get so caught up in the romance of something. And one of the things uh, that I enjoy actually chatting to Ivan, you know, um, uh, uh, when, he, when he doesn't bull me is um, he's a great mentor and a great source of inspiration. And, and um, I think it's very important, and Ivan touched on it earlier, people do have a bit of like time on their hands and times to think we, some of us are at home with like, we're not in the car driving to the office. There's a bit of extra time, time for new ideas, time for like fresh things, things you've had in the drawer, but also time to, to collaborate with a friend who's got a good perspective. And sometimes that friend will shoot you down and say, airline, now, you're crazy. Or sometimes I say, wow, that's the best thing. It's exactly what people need right now. Like an online, you know, you know like, a, I don't know, online mask and glove service. I'm sure people are doing this all over Joburg and all over the world. So but, just to jump in here, I think we're running out of time. So maybe, maybe, yeah, go for it. To all three of you. Firstly, thank you to all three of you. Tomorrow at one o'clock, we have none other then the ambassador to the to, to Argentina, a very great South African st uh, statesman, Tony Leon will be speaking to us. Everybody will give an, uh, get an invitation. 
But I want to say to all three of you who I know very well and very, for a very long time, I want to ask you all to conclude by including you, Ryan. I want to start with you, Ronnie, then to you, uh, then to you um, Ryan, and then to you, Ivan. Your very worst time, your very best moment, and an advice for all of us. And that's the way we're going to conclude it. And Ivan, you'll be the last. So it's your very worst decision, your very best decision, and what's your advice for everybody watching this? And it shouldn't take more than two minutes each. Thanks, Rabbi, for that five-minute commercial. We'll... <laughs> Go for it, Ronnie. Or, uh, not, uh, the rabbi said worst decision, but the worst, like, the toughest thing I ever did was when I went way out of my comfort zone and we went and made our first film in Los Angeles and I was green like the trees outside here and I got into trouble because uh, as my one other mental friend said, you know, you can, you can work your whole life and sign something and in one second your life changed, you know, and I, I trusted some bad people and I signed some documents, which I thought were straightforward, but they weren't. And I got into litigation and it was traumatic and I lost like 18 kilograms. And I used to shake for about, about two years. I hadn't met Ivan yet. I think that's probably why I didn't met him. Because said, who's that guy who shakes all the time? But the shakes went away and the shingles cleared up and I put the weight back on. And you know, the money was lost, but money, uh, money's round. It rolls, it comes back and forth. But you know, the, the, the trauma lasted for many years. But I never learned, when they say it's an old expression, when you lose, don't lose the lesson. So I think the lesson there was well, get mentors, get perspectives. You know, you, we're not invincible. We don't know everything. And, uh, uh, you know, when we did, when Ivan and I collaborated on material, uh, uh, a lot of those lessons were learned. And it was a fun project with no trauma and a great result for everyone. And, um, you know, there's no, there's no, there's no teacher-like experience. In terms of good, uh, good. Because I know we're uh, running out of time. In terms of good things, um, I'm, I'm going to say material was one of the highlights of my life. And I'm glad that Ivan actually uh, was part of the team and it did a lot of good for all the talent. We've all gone on to do other projects and the film is celebrated around the world. And um, it, it's something that we need in these times. It makes people laugh. It's about family. It's about uh, love, forgiveness, and it's got a timeless message. It's also about different cultures collaborating, which I also think is an important uh, um, uh, message for this kind of a call because it's time to step out of even our cultural uh, like uh, parameters. I've been lucky that I've worked with people from all over the world, different religions and, 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 and cultures and backgrounds, and that's not by design, it's by passion. You know, and, and Ivan will tell you from, and Ryan, you must know as well, in the IT world, like in the film world, people gravitate towards other people with common talents and passions. It doesn't matter if the guy's fat, thin, you know, black, white, Puerto Rican, Irish, Catholic, Jewish, Muslim. If someone's got a, a passion and a talent, we are drawn together because of that shared inspiration. Uh, and I always find that part of IT very beautiful. And same with the filmmaking work. And it, again, like I said, it wasn't because I'm such an enlightened person. It was because I was drawn to inspire people. But the fact that they might have been different to me made my life interesting. And uh, I think also now in the time of Corona, you know, we, we can actually see how small the world actually is. And it's time to also try and expand for those who haven't, like, you know, I'm sure a lot have, but to expand our horizons further. And to end off with the rabbi's third point about, um, advice. Uh, I'm not one to ever give advice, but I can say something to shade, like, you know, listen, you know, listen to your heart, never give up. Uh, but um, let me try and think of, um, let me try and think of uh, something that uh, has happened to me recently that uh, might be worthwhile sharing. Um, um, you know, that thing about, you know, I'm not an investor person. I kind of been, I learned this the hard way. I try to do investments for a while and I landed up always in pain um, uh, because I don't know, I, I, I always, yeah, whatever reason I didn't manage expectations right. So I landed up investing in myself and, uh, you know, I drive uh, projects with a bunch of people that I'm friendly with, like Ivan. Uh, um, but um, I think the thing is, um, you know, we can't be friends with the whole world, but to have like a few friends, you know, maybe two or three, 
that really like um, talk to you straight and give you like a proper perspective, I think is a, like mentors. You can't have a hundred mentors, you know, but if you're lucky to have two or three people that you can talk to and get a perspective on, I, I think it's a very, very valuable thing. Cool. Thanks, Ronnie. Ryan, you're on. Yeah, I, I'll just be uh, 30 seconds to a minute. Um, so firstly, before we run out of time, I must thank uh, you, Rabbi Chabad, and both of you guys for, for joining us this evening. I think it's been really unbelievable. I see we've had uh, many, many people join us and a lot of questions. So I'm sure if there are further questions, you could send them in and we can maybe answer them. So just to answer the Rabbi's questions, I think um, actually something that I've learned from the Rabbi is that at your worst moment, and it's really difficult to do, but, you know, at your darkest point, that is actually where the opportunity is. You know, there's nowhere to go <laughs> but up. And if yeah. you could see how you, how you change that darkness into light, um, that's what you have to try and do. It's not easy. So um, just in terms of one or two points, um, th there's, a, there's, a, there's a phrase that I love to use uh, I don't think I coined it, but it's survival mode. And I think, um, you know, when your back is against the wall, there's, you actually don't have a choice but to survive. And so all you have to do is really just take the first step uh, and then the second step and then the third step. And then, you know, you, pretty soon you've, you've walked across the road and, and, and you, you've kind of seized the opportunity. And in that respect, I agree with you. Mentorship is great. So learn from others. But at the end of the day, you know, an entrepreneur um, is generally, you know, out there and years ahead or very different to, to the norm. So if you go and ask someone what they think of your idea, they're going to think you're mad. So you have to believe in yourself. You have to back yourself. And at the end of the day, when your back's against the wall, it's only yourself that, you know, that you can rely on. And of course, in uh, God or, you know, a supreme being that you believe in. But, yeah, that, that's my two cents. Arvin, over to you. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks for hosting the show. Um, you know, Ronnie spoke about material and, you know, just I played zero role in that movie other than you know, I was, he was kind enough to put my name on as an executive producer, which means the guy writes out part of the check. So that's all that creat creativity came from Ronnie and his team. Yeah, it's very what modern. I learned there was how Ronnie inspired people that were really struggling. And these were young artists that were struggling out there. And I watched how he inspired these people, lifted them up and, and, and got them to believe in themselves. And then like, kind of create something and do something with their lives. And the, even uh, based on the alleged uh, return on investment on that movie was Ronnie's generosity, you know, in giving back to the artists was that was, was, uh, it was quite an interesting one. It was a good lesson I learned in, in in that little journey. But if you talk about, you know, bad experiences, I think what I've realized, guys, is that, you know, just you've got to decide who who you're going to business with, who you do transactions with. And I was very lucky to have a, a, a long business career with wonderful partners who uh, helped get the best out of me and I hopefully helped get the best out of them. But, so, you know, when I moved away from my comfort zone and I've invested but if, and if you doubt you know you often have a gut feeling and your gut feeling is there for a reason but you often look at a, a you know because I like looking at transactions and I like looking at opportunities but when you choose an opportunity based on the opportunity solely and you have some doubt about the people you're going into business with don't do it because every time I've gone in with the wrong people I've done something with the wrong person it's come back to bite me more than I believed yeah. it would and it's just not worth it. It's not worth your time. So if people out there that you hear about and they are unfortunately have a reputation, there's always a reason why somebody has, or somebody speaks badly about someone who they had a ne negative experience with, taking it, obviously contextualizing it. And so I, you know, my advice always was, if you're going to look at to do something, even if the opportunity is not so great, just assume it's an average opportunity. But the people are amazing. Go for it. Because you can yeah. turn a bad opportunity into a good opportunity, but you won't turn bad people into good people. And yeah, just exactly. be careful of that. It's bit me every single time. And I'm, be, I'm very lucky now to be doing some cool things with some wonderful people. Um, 
You know, I've been in business with Stephen Halbron for the past six years. He's an amazing business. He's a wonderful guy with a lot of integrity. And as a result of being a decent guy with loads of integrity, you see that coming through in the performance of a business. And, you know, various other people and uh, the experiences you and I share together, Ronnie. So thank you for all that. So I just think, you know, and the advice to people, you know, certainly I, I, I want to turn to more of the younger guys out there who are looking to do stuff, you know. You know, remember, you, you, you're going to sit there and you're going to have fears. But the only way to overcome your fears, guys, is by just getting out there and making it happen. Just, it's action. You've got to have, make it happen and you've got to execute. Execute on your vision, execute on your beliefs. And, um, and the harder you work at it, the results will come eventually, no matter how tough it does seem while you're going through it. So Rabbi Masinta, thank you for uh, giving us the opportunity to share some of these ideas with everyone. Much appreciated. And you certainly have uh, been friendly with for the past 30 years and a big source of inspiration from an entrepreneurial standpoint, besides your, your other attributes. Certainly your enthusiasm for entrepreneurship is also something that I've learned a lot from. So thank you. Guys, I want to thank you all, Hilly, Aaron. Lovely to have you, Ronnie, from Matthias and Ivan. And of course, thank you, Rabbi. God, may we all take from this, may we all take from this not to rob the world of what we can give it yes. from this evening to tomorrow morning. Let's use every energy in our soul, use the gifts that God has given us to turn this world upside down and give it what we can give it. Thank you all for joining. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Thank you for tonight. Thank you. Good luck and stay safe, Thanks, everyone. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye.